Today on Inside Utah Politics, the point of the mountain development, a look at the latest proposals to replace the state prison in Draper, and where the process goes from here. Plus, America's longest war now over, and some lawmakers want answers. Why Republicans are calling on the Speaker of the House to call lawmakers back into session. Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Glenn Mills. It is time to go Inside Utah Politics, and we do begin this morning with the latest on the Point development in Draper. Alan Matheson is the Executive Director of the Point of the Mountain Land Authority. Alan, great to have you back on the show. Thanks for being here. Well, it's good to be here. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, we had you on earlier in the process to kind of give us an idea of what was going on at that time. Uh, things have certainly changed since then, so excited to dig back into that today. But start off with just a little bit of background. What is the Point? Well, we, ref we refer to uh, that 600 acres of state-owned land currently occupied by the Draper Prison as the point. It really is uh, a unique opportunity anywhere in the country and maybe in the world where you've got 600 acres that will be undeveloped in a couple of years, starting from scratch within a an area of about 20,000 acres of undeveloped land. It's right at the border of Utah County, Salt Lake County. So uh, looking at two of the biggest population areas in the state, uh, the largest labor sheds in the state, well served by transportation right along I-15 and the Bangadar Highway and will be served by future transit. And then of course it's right in the heart of Silicon Slopes, this uh, great innovation area, a place where new ideas are being generated mm -hmm. and created. Yeah, so talk, talk a little bit more about how much of a role that played, because really you can kind of take a look at it and see it as a continuation of Silicon Slopes. Well, it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to think how we can solve problems in our community. The legislature made it clear that they wanted this to be a place where research took place. We want it to be a place where we think about the challenges of society, develop research, and then generate uh, new ways of creating and commercializing ideas that can solve those problems. There will be an innovation district at the site, uh, elements of higher education, working with industry, and some of the top minds in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were getting a look there at uh, some of the proposals. We'll dig more into those in, in just a minute. Pretty fascinating uh, when you look at those. But talk about this as an opportunity. You refer to this as a generational opportunity. Why is that? You know, we do, but uh, we're not the only ones. It's been interesting as we've talked to people around the country. This is becoming recognized nationally as really one of the great infill projects in the country and a chance to do some interesting things. We, you know, in Utah are a little concerned, I think, about growth. We know the statistics. Growth is coming fast. And there's a concern among many that it can influence and impact our quality of life, uh, maybe negatively. We know that there really aren't good ways to stop growth. So how we grow is vital. And we think this can be a site that can help us grow in very thoughtful ways, ways that have you know, future focus on new transportation ideas, more sustainable development that uses less water, fewer air emissions. It can be a place, as we said before, of innovation where we're solving problems. And I think as we do this, and if we do it right, we can create some remarkable benefits for the state. Uh, let's get back into the framework plan now. The Land Authority approving that framework uh, back on uh, August 10th and uh, releasing that so that we could all get an idea of uh, what it entails. But talk uh, more deeply about the framework, uh, the process that went into it, and what the ultimate result was? Well, we call this a framework plan because it's certainly not finished. It will evolve over time. But it gives us a really clear direction in a thoughtful way about how we can develop this and accomplish the goals that we've heard from the public and from our elected officials. Uh, it is, though, flexible. We want to make sure that it can evolve based on changes in the market and technologies. This has been developed over time with a lot of input. More than 10,000 Utahns have been part of the process. They've given their ideas and suggestions. We've also done extensive market research, really looking into what is possible now and into the future. And with all of that, 
as I said, I think we've got thoughtful direction going forward mm -hmm. that looks at how we get people around transportation, parks and open space, uh, spaces for jobs. And all of this helps us become a model of sustainable development. It generates resources that can be used for education, for infrastructure, for social services. We've got a directive to make life better for the people of Utah through this project, and we want to do just that. Let's talk a little bit more about the economic impact. How many jobs potentially do you see this creating, and, and what type of jobs uh, will they create? You know, at this point, we anticipate there will be about 35 to 40,000 jobs created at this site. There will be good, high-paying jobs in uh, high-tech or biomedical uh, fields and others. But it will also provide a range of opportunities, uh, people that have retail stores. And so, uh, you know, people that will work on the site and provide support services. We want this to be a real community, a place where people from all walks of life, all ages, can get together and f gather and feel this sense of community. Um, talk a little bit uh, more about the input that you received, because you, as you mentioned, this was an extensive process. Uh, somewhere around the neighborhood of 10,000 Utahns uh, pitching in their ideas. How did that all work? And taking all of that input, how did you, you know, put it all together in this uh, one plan that was released? You know, this is state owned land, as we said, so we all own it. And we have a responsibility to make sure that it accomplishes broad goals, broad social benefits for the people of the state. So we need to listen to them. And we have through surveys, through open houses, through working groups and stakeholder advisory committees. And over a number of months, we took the input we received, evaluated it, uh, took the best ideas, and worked with our planning team to incorporate those ideas into the framework plan. When you take a look at uh, the uh, framework that we have seen uh, throughout the interview here, you, you get the sense that this is potentially a place you could live and work. Is that the idea here behind a lot of this? It certainly is. And, you know, I think more and more people are looking for convenience in life. They want to live and work in close proximity. But that also creates other benefits. It reduces off-site traffic generation, so there are fewer cars on the road. It affects affordability. If we're traveling less, if you can live closer to where you work, then uh, you can save money. It's good for our air quality. We're not traveling as much. So I think all of these things are broad benefits that can be reflected in thoughtful planning. Talk about the next steps, Alan. What can we expect to see moving forward from now? Well, we're just getting started. There's a ways to go, and we'll continue to listen to the public. We're doing some detailed studies now to look more at smart cities, and internal circulators, uh, the sustainability measures that we might implement and more to make sure that we've got the best information driving the best decisions. And in the, the near term, uh, toward the end of the year, we'll start a transparent and open and competitive process to bring on development partners who will help us think through the issues, get started on uh, the backbone uh, infrastructure for the site, and create our vision. And will you continue to uh, gather public input in that time frame as well? As we move forward, there will be certainly opportunities for more rounds of public input, listening to ideas. We don't believe that we've got a corner of the market on all the great ideas, and so it's going to be important that we work together as a community mm -hmm. to prepare something that we can all be proud of. So those that have ideas and want to share those, what's the best advice you have for them? Well, one great way to do it is to go to the website, and it's thepointutah.org. You can see the plans on that site. You can see all of the board meetings and other meetings that we've held that have been recorded, and there are opportunities to share input on that site. Mm -hmm. And then one last question. Any estimate on when development may begin? Yes. Uh, we expect that about a year from now, the inmates will be moved to the new correctional facility. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, we can see demolition. 
You'll probably see some of the initial infrastructure going in in 2023, and then around the uh, latter part of 2024 and 2025, some buildings will start growing out of the ground. Now, this is going to take a long time to develop. This sure. is a multi-multi-year process, but uh, it'll be fun to see it come together and we'll do it together. Yep, no doubt about that. And uh, we'll have you back on the show once we get a little closer. Uh, appreciate your insight. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Coming up, we have more on the point development. We're checking in with the mayor of Draper to get his thoughts on the project and how it will impact the city. Stay with us. We continue our conversation now on the point development through the local community perspective. Troy Walker is the mayor of Draper. Mayor Walker, great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, let's talk about uh, redeveloping the prison site. Of course, we all remember when that was considered to be out in the boons. Not the case anymore. So you've been a longtime advocate of redeveloping that area. Talk about why. You know, it's, it's, I mean, it's been a long time as a prison. Everything's developed up around it, and it makes sense now for it to be something a lot nicer and more important than a prison, so that's why. And talk about how the city has been involved in collaborating with the state to get to this point that we are now. We, we've done a lot of, uh, of advocating. You know, I've been involved since, really, since I've been involved in politics, trying to, to convince, you know, the powers that be that this is the right thing to do. And so we've been involved in the advocacy part of it, and then our, our currently our staff and our city manager are all involved in with the point board and the point technical folks in you know in helping put together the actual sort of structure mm -hmm. you know from, from a utility perspective and public works perspective and some of the technical perspective so we're we're right there with them um, we you know we're in it we've been involved in it the entire the entire time and so you know we, it means a lot to us so we want to see it done right and we want to see it done in a way that we know will work uh, we talked with Alan about how this is a project all Utahns can claim ownership of, but it does fit within your city limits. So let's talk about the specific impact it could have on the city of Draper. From the broader context, how do you see this? You know, it's, it's unique for us. I mean, we're, we're fortunate in the sense that, you know, we've had this prison for a long time, and we've, as we've had, had the prison here, it's served all of Utahns. Everybody, you know, benefits from the prison for what it does. Now it's an opportunity for this to also benefit the rest of Utah. Um, and my city from from what it will do and so we're excited about the economic opportunity and the quality of life and um, just the the financial and employment perspectives and you mm -hmm. know all the opportunities that we can have in a place like this so centrally located just perfect you know location 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 yeah it's a great spot and it's going to make it it's going to make a huge difference to my city for sure but it's going to make a, a huge difference to the state of utah so I'm glad to be a part of that. Okay, I, I want to dig into a couple things you just uh, said a, a little deeper. Let's start with uh, what you heard specifically from Draper residents. Draper residents, you know, we, we have kind of a, uh, we have part of our community that's more rural and older, uh, although most of it is developed up. I mean, Draper in and of itself is primarily built out except for this really this prison site. So my community, they see that as the place for the future growth. And that's that's what all of your survey we've done. We, we did a scientifically, you know, valid survey a, a year or so ago, and that that's what everyone in our community said, hey, that's where it should go. We want it to go there. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. We want to see it be something really fan fantastic, but that's where it should go. That's where our future growth should go. So folks are on board with that concept, and that's proved out over the Point of the Mountain Commission, even if you go back a little further, as we've studied the whole Point of the Mountain area, that's what people want. People chose a denser and more, you know, high-end development, right, sort of in that mm -hmm. high-tech area. You also mentioned the economic impact on the city of Draper. Talk more, though, if you will, about specifically that impact and particularly tax revenue and what it may mean for, for budgets for the city. Well, you know, typically cities, we, we, we mostly live off sales tax revenue. Now, I don't necessarily see the prison side as being a great sales tax revenue generator, but I'm certain it will be. But it's certainly a place where you're going to have valuable buildings, uh, valuable development. You're going to have... Um, what I hope to be some of the best paying jobs in the country, if not the best, right there. So that economic spin-off that's gonna that's gonna spread statewide is what we're 
what we're really looking for. I, you know, it's going to benefit us from a property tax perspective. Certainly, there'll be sales tax. But when you have high paying, high quality employment um, research and, and, you know, great housing and, and recreational opportunities all in that little area, it's going to benefit us. It's going to benefit my, our neighboring mm -hmm. cities and the state. Do you, do you see this becoming a type of city center, maybe? I mean, I know City Hall is, is uh, on the other side of town, but this appears like it's going to be a huge draw and could be potentially a place where there are city functions and whatnot Absolutely. as well. I think you're right on. Um, it's, it has the potential to be the place to be, um, and not only just for Draper, but a really a kind of a, the place to be for everywhere. Um, if we do it right and you look at the, you know, sort of the concepts, that's going to be... It's going to be a place you want to spend some time. You may want to work, and you probably want to live. Um, we, you know, our goal is to make it a place where the car is not the king, where you can have immediate access to all the great open space we already have, and even the stuff that's going to go there. High quality of life. I'm still holding out and advocating for a sports entertainment complex, professional <laughs> sports, you know, entertainment, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we're looking for. So, so you actually bring up a good point there. There, when you take a look at these plans, you just say, wow, and you're kind of uh, blown away by them. But yet there's still more that could even develop from this. Oh, absolutely. Um, and the good news about this, the, one of the cool things about this project is it doesn't have to be built overnight. You know, we have the luxury as the point board and as the state to really to do it the way we want to do it. We can, we can do it in pieces. Um, there's no requirement that it be built in the next, you know, five years. I mm -hmm. think this is a long-term project. I hope it is. I want to look long term. I want to bring the right stuff there to start and, and have it just kind of launch itself and, and move along. But we have this great luxury to be able to develop it as we need to and to really, you know, focus. I mean, Alan said a lot of times, look, we, we have this opportunity to, you know, we have a concept, but we can really drive this, you know, wagon because we're, we're, it's, a, it's the state's property and it's our board's job mm -hmm. to do. And so it's unique and it's exciting, actually. OK, so we're looking at some pictures from the framework that was uh, released there. You see residential, uh, some commercial, and, and a mix. Uh, talk about your favorite parts of the framework that has been released. Well, I love the, I love the concept of sports entertainment, the open space connection. So mm -hmm. we have this river to range concept, which is probably my favorite part of it. Um, it connects that Jordan River Parkway Trail, which I know you've ridden on, um, and it connects it across the freeway with the bus rapid transit, multimodal transit that's going to take people from the prison site, you know, over across the freeway to where Pluricite is, and then down to Lehigh and then parts into Utah County. But that river to range con connection is going to be the first really safe, uh, you know, com a trail that a person can bike or hike across. You can go to Jordan River, to the Port of Rockwell. We just opened a, a, a bridge over the Timpanogos Highway in Lehigh two weeks ago that connects the Murdoch Canal Trail. So this prison site is going to be connected via paved trail. Really, you can go from Ogden to here, from here to Provo Canyon and back once we have it in place. So the connectivity for active transportation is going to be phenomenal, and I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. Look, we, also, we also have a central park in mm -hmm. the concept that's going to be also an, another addition to our 4,500 acres of open space. Yeah, talk, talk more about transportation because that's a lot of, that's, that's an important point of this. The idea here to significantly reduce the need for cars. How does that uh, fit in with the city vision? You know, Glenn, we got to do this different than we've done anything else. This has got to be a place where we do the transit first. We put it in place first, and so we can show, you know, the, the future tenants, the future owners, this is what, what it's going to look like. This is how it's connected. So, so often, just because of how it's gone, we've had to build the transit to things afterwards. This is a unique opportunity for the state and for us to put it in first. And, and we got to do it in a way that the car is not king. We, we just, it's just going to have to be the concept going forward. We're going to do this in a way that you, you can get to this site, you can live in this site, and you can get out of this site without having to drive. Now, there will be cars. I'm not saying there won't. But we don't know what the future of transportation is going to be, especially public transportation. There's all kinds of things on the horizon. And this is going to give us an opportunity to build a community around the current best practices and what's looking, what we can see in the future as far as multimodal transportation. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Mayor, we just have about a minute left. So as we uh, wrap this up, what is the role of the city moving forward? Our job is to, you know, we're, we're going to provide all this municipal services, police, fire, public works. We're going we're gonna to plan and, and use our technical skills and ability to do the things cities do, you know, provide technical assistance in planning roads and 
sewer and, and you know, public utilities and infrastructure, all those things that we do. We're gonna be there and we're gonna provide those services and we're gonna, it's gonna become part of Draper. Um, it's gonna become the unique part of Draper and it's gonna be an awesome part of Draper, so we're excited. Yeah, as someone who lives in the city of Draper, I know there's a lot of energy ar around this and excitement as to see how it all plays out. I, uh, if, you, if you look, just in closing, mm -hmm. if you've worked at this place, you could get on your bike from your office at lunch, cross that freeway on that new bridge, and be up in Corner Canyon riding vertigo, levitate. <laughs> you could go up there and have a, an afternoon and get back to work, and it, it's gonna be fantastic. Yep, some of my favorite trails. Indeed. Maybe I'll see you on them. Yes. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate your time. Thanks Thank for being you. here. All right, still to come, the Department of Education takes aim at states with mask mandate bans, including right here in Utah, the latest on that investigation after the break. America's longest war is over. Now some Republicans are calling on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to bring the House back into session to address the situation. They want the House to consider legislation that would mandate reports on Americans left behind in Afghanistan. Washington correspondent Anna Warnicke reports. Even though it isn't in session, nearly two dozen Republicans stood on the House floor Tuesday, calling for legislative action to bring all Americans in Afghanistan home. Basically, demand from the administration that they tell us how many people are left behind, how many Americans have been stranded and abandoned uh, in Afghanistan. But after that protest failed, the House stands adjourned. Texas Republican August Fluger says it's time for Plan B. Fluger says Republicans will reintroduce their bill when the House debates the National Defense Authorization Act later this week. We will be bringing amendments to that process, and we will let the Afghanistan issue um, really get, get into the details uh, of this bill. On Tuesday, President Biden defended his decision to withdraw from Afghanistan. The extraordinary success of this mission was due to the incredible skill, bravely, and selfless courage of the United States military and our diplomats. It's not mission complete until we get every one of our people back. But Texas Republican Roger Williams says the focus right now needs to be helping the roughly 200 Americans still in the country. We need to know what's happening. We need to, them to give us reports. And Texas Republican Michael McCall vows to hold the administration accountable with or without the support of Democrats. To get to the bottom of how did this get so wrong? In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. Education leaders in Iowa, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Utah are facing civil rights investigations from the Department of Education for their ban on mask mandates in schools. Washington correspondent Rashad Hudson explains what the investigations entail. The Department of Education says the ban on masks in schools in some states could violate students' civil rights. We believe that that is preventing students from accessing um, education. Um, due to fears of illness. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona says the mask bans hurt students' learning opportunities. We're going to do everything we can to protect uh, our students' access to public education, which is a fundamental right. The Department of Education's investigation will also look at whether states are violating the Americans with Disabilities Act by putting vulnerable children at greater risk. Look at the data in the places where children are ending up in the hospitals. It's more likely to happen in places where they're not uh, requiring masks. If the investigation finds these states aren't following federal law, their funding could be in jeopardy. But Republicans like Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville argue that schools should be governed by the states and not the federal government. For us to make decisions up here in Washington, D.C. for every state in the country makes no sense. That's not what this government's about. The Department of Education has not opened investigations in other states because the courts are already blocking the enforcement of their mask bans. Reporting in Washington, Rashad Hudson. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more Inside Utah Politics right after the break.
We leave you now with a look at what's on the radar in the world of politics. Congress on recess. Senators return to Capitol Hill Monday, September 13th. The House follows on September 20th. And the municipal general election is just a few months away. It's set for Tuesday, November 2nd. Make sure to connect with me on social media. I'd like to know what you think of this show and other issues that are important to you. You can email me at InsideUtahPolitics at ABC4.com. You can also connect with me on Twitter and Facebook. Just log on and search Glenn Mills ABC4. Thanks so much for making us part of your Sunday morning. We hope to see you again next week as we go Inside Utah Politics.